Welcome to episode 8 of The Leap Home, Kamikaze Kid. In this week's episode, Sam arrives in 1961 in the body of a 17-year-old boy a few days before his sister's wedding. Driven by the memory of his own sister's abusive marriage, Sam sets out to protect Cheryl Wilson from a similar fate. With the big day drawing near, he must convince her that her fiancé is a fraud, but can he force the bully to drop his mask? Or will he end up on the wrong end of the fight? What is this? <laughs> no Playboy magazine. Old. Miss May looks pretty fresh to me. Good afternoon, Ian. How are we? Not too bad, Jerry. How are you? Fresh. As fresh as Miss May? I wish. Miss May not. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. I'll tell you what I really liked about this week's episode. What? The sets and the costumes. I thought it was really nicely done. They were. However, it suggested that it was of an earlier time. That's the thing that sort of stood out for me or it rankled a little bit. This should have been in the mid to late 50s, not 1961. And there's not really any reason for it not to, other than Kennedy. Mm -hmm. They wanted to put it after Kennedy was elected in 1960. That was, that was, That's mm. the only thing in the episode that would have dated it to that point. Yeah. And the, obviously the Peace Corps didn't exist before Kennedy set it up. Sure, but you could have had another sort of MacGuffin yeah. For for her to be doing something. Some other charity or something. Yeah. yeah. Because, yeah, it had a feel of the uh, grease, the, the T-birds and the... Yeah, which is set in the 50s, yeah. Yeah. There's even a, a part here where Buddy Holly was still playing on the radio. And he died in 59, two years before this. Well, Buddy Holly still plays on the radio. He does, but if you're setting it, I suppose they were listening to the music of the day. I'm not sure. Oh, well, well, maybe. But if you try to set the scene, it says 50s more than... In the 60s, 60s, you've got the Beatles and what have you. I think there's that, that, that watershed, and although they didn't come until a few years later, I suppose there was that period between the, the, the tail end of the 50s. Okay, certainly plenty in here to discuss, not just the date. Oh, there's a lot. There's one thing that you pointed out to me earlier today that I wasn't aware of, which Some is grave concern potentially if you believe it to be accurate. Well, we'll get to that. I think some. <laughs> Uh, people familiar with this story will already have twigged what that might be. Right. Before we get to it, use the usual promos at this point. Um, social media. Find us at Leap Home Podcast on Instagram and on Twitter. We're at The Leap Home on Facebook and our website's theleaphome.com. But the place that you want to be leaving your comments and your thumbs up and your ringing bells. Subscribes. On YouTube. If you're listening on YouTube, hit the subscribe and the like button right now if you haven't already done so we can wait let's take a few seconds there's no rush we can we've got all night so sure yep just leave me still done it yep you done okay okay thanks now hit the bell and do it again next week we're trying to grow the you i mean the youtube channel is about 0.01 percent of our listeners but we'd like to grow that expand that the key point is you get to listen to the episodes early if you're on youtube one yes. week early you do indeed and if you like Listening audio only. I think there's ways to do that, isn't there? If you've got the the premium account, which I have, no Indeed. ads. Yeah. Also, in terms of reviewing the show, we'd appreciate a wee five star review over at Apple Podcasts, which seems to be the driving force. But also any podcast software you use, if they allow ratings, if you could rate us, it would be great. If you're not going to give us the top rating, then don't bother. Don't bother not, listening. Not interested. Five stars only. It's not that we're ungrateful, but yeah, it, it drags us down and. We don't want that. No, we don't have to work harder to make things better. No, 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 no. Anyway, shall we take a look at some Quantum Leap? Let's crack on. Similar sort of intro to last week that kind of bleeds into the leap from the end of the episode with Sam arriving in the, the middle of a race. Yeah, we're under a bridge and after skidding to a halt, he throws away his cigarette, coughs, and is then unimpressed by the spotty dork that he sees in the mirror. I'm pretty sure he wipes some drool off his face as well. Probably in bits of breakfast and things. He says he's a dork with teeth that could pick up radio signals. <laughs> Are we told at this point what year it is, what the date? Well, yes, when we go to Pinky's Burgerland, it comes up on the screen. It says June 6th, 1961. I'm glad you weren't, yeah, you didn't just go for the, the year this time. Put a little bit of effort into it, thank yeah. you. Uh, as always. No, not as always. Sam says in a voiceover that he has checked his driver's license which tells him an awful lot about himself yes i was wondering how they how he knew this but on you go 
He's 17, he's a hot rod jockey, he loves junk food and has the zits to prove it. When he pulls up at, uh, at Pinky's, he immediately has uh, some fries thrown at him from three... Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to use the word fanny here. Now, <laughs> and this is for an American audience. So, in, in America, it's, it's an inoffensive term for your, your bottom, okay? Now, where we're from, it's slightly more offensive, but I can assure you, when I say these guys are a bunch of fannies, <clears throat> I'm referring to the American uh, usage. Do they use it in that way in America? I don't know, but that's how I'm using it. We can't, we won't get pulled up by, by calling them fannies. Okay. So yeah, there's three fannies who uh, are probably the popular guys around school, and I they insult. They yeah, they uh, insult his mom mobile. Yeah, there's also a, a moment where he says he wants to have a burger and malt. What's a malt? A malt shake. What's like that? A, it's like a milkshake with malt in it, like cold Horlicks. No, no, I don't know what malt. Like the inside of a Malteser? No. Well, it's but made, but be made from malt. Yeah, there'll be that flavouring through it. You don't really get that. Or I've never come across that here. Uh -huh. I like malt stuff. I like um, you used to get it as a, a syrup, like a like a a, a jar of it here, and that was a thing in the seventies. And it's serious. I was given a spoonful of that as like a sort of pick me up sometimes by my grandfather. I'm yeah. sure it didn't do any good at all, but it was like a, a vitamin type thing. He'd have a spoonful of malt. I also like um, cod liver oil. No, I, I take that, but I don't like it. But um, I like uh, sorin, which is oh fruit loaf. Yeah, that's malt, malt loaf. Is that malted fruit loaf? Mm -hmm, it's nice. I like uh, granary bread. That's malted, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But anyway, anyway, yeah, I, I've, yeah. I've just never come across this. Very drink uh, a malt. Yeah, other than whiskey, you hear it all the time, and you don't watch any movies that are pre nineteen ninety. But all the classics would be having a burger and malt. Bur burger and malt, yeah. Okay, well, maybe I'm the one who's wrong. They go to the drugstore sometimes, they would have it. They would have a, a, a fountain at the drugstore and they'd have a, a nice cream there. Okay. Like that's a, um, Andy Griffith show type stuff, I think. Anyway, um, yeah, these guys are insulting his car, even though they have their names embroidered on their jackets. Yeah, and their, their gang name or whatever they want to call yeah, their name. Yeah, the Impalers. Impalers. Yeah. Yeah. Is that not a type of car? must be i don't know but like these, these are the fannies yeah one of them says it's too bad they weren't racing for pinks or he could have wiped this eyesore off of the boulevard yeah i wasn't sure what that was at the start of the episode we find out later it does I... explain it later on yeah. yeah i had it in my trivia before that but unfortunately yeah it all comes out the leader bobby he arrives with his best girl and these uh these guys all head over to brown knows him yeah and sam is a bit surprised that the girl beckons him specifically yeah, she excitedly tells him that she got accepted into the Peace Corps. Yes, and it's revealed why she's called him over when she says not to tell their parents. Yes. So she's his sister. Apparently they're going to drive up to San Francisco. This is Cheryl, his sister, and Bobby before getting a, a flight. And she seems genuinely into the whole experience. She's buying into what they're doing, but Bobby is less convincing. Well, she says she's going to set up a food cooperative and he's going to teach the natives new ways to fish. You're going to teach islanders to fish when you're a guy from California. How's that? Huh? Okay. Yeah, I'm sure they don't have any idea how to fish in Tonga. <laughs> he seems like he just wants to, to party as he toasts the people from, or the country he's going to, from his hip flask. Indeed. The fannies then start picking on a girl called Jill by taking her purse and throwing it around between them. Yeah, but Sam's able to intervene, grab it, and give it back to her. Sam is very impressive uh, in this episode, isn't he? He's very heroic and he <laughs> plays the, the yeah, he, he, he plays the, the sort of, he's like a, a spotty Jack Reacher. He's slightly cooler than his character is made out to be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Jill runs off and Cheryl goes after her, telling them to stop acting like JDs. And I got that reference. What was that? Juvenile delinquents. Ah, right. Okay. As the uh, the fannies surround Sam. Yes, and while they do, Cheryl is calming Jill down and uh, she apologises and says that they're always talking her down. And Cheryl, she points out, she's got a, 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 a good understanding, a good take on the whole situation. She's a bit more mature and knows what's going on. She points out they're just insecure idiots. And uh, Jill says that she wouldn't go near any of them apart from one of them. Yeah, because Cheryl says that they'll be dying to date her when she's a bit older. 
And she says the only one she would have any interest in is Cam. Yeah, who is tough. Cam slash Sam. We had Cam and Sam here in the past, that we got this country into a whole lot of trouble. Oh, Sam Cam. Yeah, yeah she did. What he did. Yeah. Meanwhile, Sam or Cam mm -hmm. is getting pantsed. He says you can't pants a guy with glasses. So they take the glasses off and then his trousers stroke pants to find that he is a commando. Indeed, but they continue to remove his jeans anyway. And his top. Bobby's not joining in, but is laughing along from the car. Yeah, he's a sneaky wee rat bag. Oh yeah. So it's obviously the the, uh, the girlfriend's brother, so he can't be seen to be actively participating, but he doesn't stop or help. He enjoys it and he wishes he could be there stripping yeah. this young boy. He's a fake tough guy. Oh, he's a very fake tough guy, as we come to come to learn. Yeah, they, they fire him into the, the dumpster as, oh boy, plays in the background, Buddy Holly. <laughs> At this point, Al shows up and makes a reference that I think is probably a bit dated for modern audiences, but... Maybe it was funny at the time. What was that? He gets him nine and a half on the dive, but it would have been ten if it wasn't for the Russian blood on his mother's side. So that's going to be a reference to Olympic judging on presumably skating or gymnastics. Al was, uh, he was wearing quite a striking silver suit and red sunglasses. He was, and Sam's wearing nothing. Apart from a pair of socks. Always keep your socks on. Unfortunately, Al says he can't help because he's only a hologram. At this point, Bobby drives around to get Cheryl. And she asked Jill if she wants her to tell Sam about the uh, the attraction. Yeah. But she's obviously too embarrassed to, to do this and ask her not to. Indeed. But then she comes out and finds Sam naked in the dumpster and picks up his clothes for him. She tries to then repeat what Cheryl told her about their insecurities. I don't think she quite nails the, the speech the same way. No, but I think Sam, being a bit older and more worldly, understands what she's getting at and appreciates what uh, the intentions are. I also quite liked um, Al talk, telling his story about uh, the Vegas stripper. <laughs> uh, Sam scrabbles around for his glasses and Jill asks if he got pantsed for her. And when he says yes, she almost runs off with his clothes out of sheer excitement. <laughs> and at this point, Al declares it to young love. <laughs> Which I think it is, and this episode there was a there, there was a, a a tenderness to it. I think there was a genuine. Um, it, it wasn't cloying. Okay, it wasn't too saccharine. I quite liked the relationships here. Okay. At the front of Pinky's is, is it Pinky's? No. Yeah. Pinky's Burger uh, Land. Land. Yeah. Sam gets this massive order. Yes, he returns to find his usual excessive food order. And wants to know about when and why he is. Al, what year is this? 1961. Great. The tail end of the most immature period in history. All the guys still drink malts, drive hot rods, and wear butch wax in their hair. And the girls all have pillow fights, chat on the phone, blind dates, and get their panties raided. Uh, those were the good old days. Ooh, man, that looks good. Want a bite? Mm. Oh, sorry, your hologram. Oh, look at this mint 60 Corvette. Did you ever notice that girls never cuddle up to guys unless they're driving a fancy car? I mean, you've never seen a, a woman throw herself at a guy in a, in a Rambler. Never. Hal, you gonna let a car like that rule your life? Yes. You know? Maybe I'm here to clear up this kid's complexion. Looks like he's gonna die of terminal acne. No, Sam, you're not here for camp. According to Ziggy, there's an 82.6% chance you're here to keep Cheryl from marrying Bob. Well, they look like the perfect couple. Yeah, but Ken and Barbie grow up. Bob ends up selling used cars for his father and getting arrested a lot of times for drunken driving. Cheryl? Well, she never made it to the Peace Corps, never saw much of the world. Ziggy's gotta be wrong. She's bright and alive. I can't see anything stopping her. Well, evidently, Bob did. He also appears to have been a mean drunk. Who didn't hit her? Well, let's just say she had more than her share of accidental falls. Sam's so very upset by this explanation of what's in the future for his sister. Yeah, he's clearly disturbed. And he explains that it was because his sister, his real sister, yeah, married at 17 and her husband was an abusive drunk. Al tells him that that obviously wasn't his fault, but he says maybe that wasn't, but this time it would be. 
Yeah, and I think again I can understand the so the the drivers in this episode they're, they're powerful and yeah. I'm interested to know what would happen if Sam failed to, to achieve what he was meant to achieve. Would he leap anyway? Did you mean in general? Yeah, if he, if she got married, um, don't know, stuck there forever. Yeah, I think or, so. or once it's too late to put it right, does he just leap anyway? And it's like oh, it's too late, move on. Maybe. Don't know if we we'll ever find that out. We should, because surely he'll fail sometime. Well, you would think. Anyway, later on, he's at home, or he arrives home. Yeah, how did he know where he lived? He's in his driver's license. Yeah, but you don't know where that is. It's not. You don't have a sat nav or a map on you. Yeah, maybe you found one. Okay, checked his online. He enters the house and he smells as he takes in the nostalgia of the place as Leave It to Beaver plays on the TV. Which you instantly recognised. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I don't actually think I've ever watched a, an episode, but it's referenced so many times in movies and other TV shows that I've watched. Ameri it's, you know, it's, a, it's a slice of Ameri Americana. Okay. Sam's dad comes in in his pants and a vest and starts punching him in the arm. Yeah, this reminded me of the family in uh, Police Academy. I think I've referenced that before. Is that very old school, isn't it? How you doing, son? You're the, the, the sort of... The, the. Although, I don't know. It, it's weird, this, because no one ever really in this episode thinks that Sam's acting differently to how he should be. Now, you look at this guy, maybe it's just because of his appearance that you think he's a, a spotty wee nerd. Yeah. But he doesn't look the, the type of sort of jock son that you would be punching in the arm. You know, he's, This looks like the kind of dad who just assumes that his son is that way he wants his son to be a jock so he just treats him like one yeah maybe maybe i don't know anyway sam ends up with two dead arms and a word in his ear that his mother's looking for him and she's on the warpath yeah so he starts to creep around the house and sure enough is called on by his mother in the kitchen she's all sorts of things going on with her hair foils at least some kind of bowl yeah i think some home dyeing malarkey she's up to ah uh, but she's not happy no, we heard at the top of the show about the issue of Playboy with Miss May. <laughs> and it's now June, so it's obviously the most recent issue. Yeah, yeah it probably gets it to delivered. Although Sam describes it as an old issue. Right. <laughs> she tells him that it was found by... Okay, so here, I've got a few questions here. It was found by the cleaning lady, and he will be grounded if another quits, as three already have. Now, to me, they look like a middle, lower middle class average family. Why would they have been going through cleaners? Well, maybe it's just something that they prioritise. Maybe the mother just doesn't like to clean. I'm just thinking this is like a sort of typical 1950s um, household where the man works and the mother stays at home and she bakes apple pie and does all that type of yeah. thing, right? I can't see many 1950s housewives of, of that uh, income level having cleaners. Well, it might just be that they were more affordable at the time. Uh, okay, but I'm just saying I've, I've, all the TV shows, all the movies I've watched... I have never seen any having cleaners just for the hell of it. No. That Mostly not. you watch Colombo where they all have cleaners but they're very yeah, rich. They're very rich, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Also, why are the cleaners walking out because they find a... Again, I said, I'm answering my own question here. Maybe it's because that Playboy was really scandalous. It would be like finding your hard drive these days. It just would look like a hard drive. Hmm? It would just look like a hard drive to a cleaning lady. Yeah, but if you looked into it, what would she discover? She'd be, she'd, I'm quitting right now. I'm out of here. Well, this stuff I cannot shouldn't dig into things that aren't any of your business exactly it's your own fault don't look anyhow there's a weird message here about Cheryl needing help with errands after the bridal shower which doesn't really get picked up on much I don't think although it probably places him back at the house at the yeah. time tomorrow um, and then he leaves and is shouted into Cheryl's room yeah but before that um, the mother asks for a, a kiss oh yeah she insists that he kisses her before he leaves yeah <laughs> So yeah, in Cheryl's room, she who, who does she refer to him as? Tab Hunter. Does she? Who's that? Oh, well, he's a movie star of the of the day. Of the day. Okay. And giggles as she reveals that Jill has a crush on him. Jill asks you not to mention this. Yeah, but she doesn't care. No, obviously not. She knows better. Yep. Um, he says that she's awfully young. We'll get back to that. Um, but Cheryl points out she's only a year behind him. Um, before they talk about her signed JFK photo. Yeah, uh, she was working for the his campaign. Yeah, he was elected a year earlier, not quite a year. Yeah. We also find out that he was preparing to ask uh, Jill out. JFK was? Probably. Well, he doesn't need to ask, does he? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yes, he probably, um, he had seen this photo for her and wants to go out with Jill. <laughs> 
uh, the, the two of them then reminisce about a time that she accidentally scratched Cam's face with her long nails after he broke her Elvis record. Before they discuss her future, and Sam makes a suggestion that doesn't go down too well. Strange. Now that I'll finally be doing what I've always dreamed of. It's a little scary. How did you know? Oh, I've had the feeling. You're going to do great. You really think so? I guarantee it. Oh, what do you know? The furthest you've ever been away from home is the Pomona Hospital. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, God. Oh. So jittery lately. Well, you know, uh, leaving home, getting married, you got a lot to be jittery about. Yeah. Maybe you ought to take it, you know, one step at a time. Wait to get married until after the Peace Corps. <laughs> you know I can't. Bob won't go unless we get married first. Why? Well, he just won't. I don't know. <laughs> well, maybe he's not the guy for you, then. What's wrong with Bob? Well, for starters, he drinks too much. Yeah, he's just celebrating our wedding and graduating and everything, that's all. What if he never stops celebrating? Well, he won't have much of a choice, will he? There's not a whole lot of liquor stores in Tonga. If he goes to Tonga... What do you mean by that? Just a hunch. I don't believe you. One minute you think Bob is the greatest, and the next thing you're just tearing him down! Look, I just want what's best for you. Well, it's too late for that, isn't it? I'm getting married in three days. Well, that's an interesting response, that last one. What was that? It's too late for what's best for her. Yeah, I think once you've put the, the wheels of mo in motion for a wedding, it's hard to stop the... Yeah, but it sounds like she accepts that the wedding's not what's best for her. Yeah. Maybe. Or she's at least not 100% certain. And this relationship, again, it's confusing. It's nice, but confusing, considering, you know, you see the, the spotty, geeky, younger brother. Yep. But, obviously, but normally this is played out as, you know, he's a pest and... There's some kind of rivalry. Yeah. yeah, and they don't like each other. I mean, they love each other, but they don't go on. They don't confide in each other and have chats and talks about marriage and weddings and things. So it's, yeah. it's a bit odd that this is, let's say, not necessarily bad, but just... Different dynamic. Yeah. I think maybe it's just a look off him when you see him. Just like a spotty wee geeky guy. He don't, <laughs> he doesn't come across as... Yeah, it's different when you see him as um, Sam. Of course. Yeah, but obviously when you see him as Sam, he's a, a more mature person who yeah. can dole out this sort of advice and be more exactly. sensitive. But geeky boy, he just loves cars and as we heard there, previously worshipped uh, Bob. Yeah, it must seem strange to share all this coming from him. Very strange. Yeah. Anyway, next day outside the house. Sam is working with Jill on the car, but his Swiss cheese memory prevents him from providing a, a full solution to their camshaft problem. He tricks Jill into showing him how to do it and heads inside. And you get a smile. I think he, for two reasons, he appreciates Jill's abilities, yep. but also his own manipulation. Well, that's it. He was quite chuffed with his little trick. Yeah. Inside, we get a shocking revelation about Al. He is a sex offender. And a massive pervert. Well, we knew he was a massive pervert, but he's now breaking the law. He has been watching Cheryl try on her bridal lingerie. So you have to ask a question. With his um, the access he has by being a hologram, what other non-consensual stuff does he get up to? Well, we can only imagine it's lots of stuff that's similar to this. Yeah. Because he's exposed himself here. Probably. Probably. <laughs> uh, just lucky he's a hologram and nothing can be... Yeah. Mm. Even as uh, Sam comes in, he's looking at a dress and saying that Tina would look good without that on. Yeah, he also admits this is he's not there for uh, for any reason uh, other than... Yeah, he's, got nothing, pair, he's nothing to say to Sam. It promptly vanishes. Yeah. Cam's... Or Sam's Sam. mother comes through, tells him off for coming in covered in grease and dirt and says with a grimace that Cheryl's trying on Mrs. Thompson's wedding dress. Yeah, the mother in law prospective mother-in-law. Seems to be a point of consternation. She, yeah, she storms out, leaves in her car as Cheryl runs after her unsuccessfully trying to, to stop her from going. Yeah, Cheryl explains to Sam that their mother wanted her to wear her wedding dress 
but that Bobby wanted her to wear his mother's dress and she's fed up with people telling her what they want. Yeah, I think she's, I think it's maybe fairly typical, she's becoming overwhelmed with the whole wedding thing, the pressures. She was getting people. Too many people, it's getting on top. You're always trying to please the different factions, yeah. aren't you? It's getting on top of her. So she breaks down in tears and when Sam goes to help her uh, with her dress, what does he notice? Well, first of all, that his hands seem to have cleaned themselves. Right. And he's not going to damage your dress with these greasy, dirty, oily hands. Yeah, I can imagine these days you can near someone with a wedding dress with greasy exactly. hands. Exactly. Secondly, that she's got two massive bruises in the back of her neck. It looks like she's been like picked up by the collar. Yeah, uh, she claims that it was due to a fall. It's quite a weird fall to a very specific fall. Back there. But I'm also asking here, I'm thinking, did she either sub subconsciously or deliberately want him to notice this because she didn't she did ask for him to, yeah and she was quite happy for him to look there she must know that they're there yeah mm. she tells him to leave it but he says that she's his sister so he can't and at this point bobby shows up yeah this uh the head fanny he is arrives with compliments and flowers and she hurries inside claiming it to be bad luck for her for him to see her in the, the wedding dress and he tr goes to try and follow but what happens uh, Sam puts his hand out to stop him on the chest. This was it was nice. It was forceful. It's the type of thing that you want to see. You as, as a viewer, you're thinking, "Don't let this yeah. th this guy uh, get away with us." So he's uh, a bit taken aback by this intervention, and Sam gets straight to the point by mentioning the the bruise, and then demonstrating on him exactly how she would have gotten it by pinching at his his neck. This was nice as well. Yeah, because you can see the. F almost anxiety on Bobby's face at this point he's not ready for this yeah he pushes him away and is he's, he's barely able to control his, his seethe but he's not going to try and fight back and bearing in mind I think uh, Bob's a, a fairly big guy yeah. a jock type you would think he could take and Sam. the wee nerdy he's a few years older anyway he is yeah but it, it doesn't he so he's shown himself up to here not only to be obviously like, we know a coward enemy and an abusive person but he as soon as he's a typical type of uh bully with some kind of legitimate challenges backing down backs down and he throws the flowers at sam as he um he he gets out of there although he does tell him that um he'll yeah, be around later back at six for the rehearsal which and happens at the tail of the cock yeah, it does but yeah i just thought at the end of that scene there there was some nice tension created by it was like a it was out of play out of time but it was a, a synth score uh -huh. a little bit like john carpenter you know it was just sort of holding the the notes the chords um t together it was yeah a bit of conflict it was yeah so the the, the tail of the cock hmm uh, at the wedding rehearsal the minister concludes matters and then bobby's dad shows up late and probably a bit drunk and is chastised by his wife who says he won't know what to do on the day yeah, so we're seeing a couple of things here that the, the drinking perhaps runs in there, or the attitude runs in the family. Yeah. He has got the feeling of Danny DeVito and Matilda about him. Well, I think this guy's entire career has been sort of sub Danny DeVito roles. Yeah. He's a, yeah, an unknown face. He is. He says that he does know what he'll do in the day, drink heavily, which causes all the idiots in the room to laugh and the others to look concerned. Yeah. He then tells Bobby that he closed two deals and that's why he's a wee bit late. Then he kisses Cheryl square in the lips and tells her that if Bobby hadn't got there, he'd have snapped her off himself. A bit Trumpian almost. That would be his own daughter. Yeah. He then invites everyone to the dinner and Bobby's mother comes over to apologise to Cheryl, telling her that he just started celebrating early. There are some nice scenes. The mother doesn't say a lot in terms of explaining what's going on, but the, the, the direction uh, and the focus on her when her husband is doing this she plays the sort of the downtrodden scared it's almost like uh, here's a sign for you cheryl this is what you've got in store yeah and she knows that i think she's worried she probably wants to say to cheryl don't do this mm -hmm. I, i've experienced this and it's not good but obviously she doesn't feel as if she should or can sam goes to say like father like son but is uh, punched on the same sore arm yeah through in the the dining area whilst bill regales the wedding party with some hilarious jokes sam has been humiliated by being placed where? At the children's table. Although he does say this is the most humiliating and um, worst abuse he's suffered since he started leaping, which maybe takes some of the things that have happened a bit lightly. Well, yeah, from the <laughs> colour of truth where he wasn't allowed to, <laughs> yeah. to eat at a diner. Or drink out the right fountain. Yeah. But I, I, I did, I, I liked this, uh, this little scene. I liked he's got a wine glass full of milk. 
<laughs> it was good, wasn't it? The drunk and slurring Bill then stands to make a toast, which um, embarrasses all of the, the right thinking. At least the women yeah. in the room, yeah. He, I think, yeah, he thanks the most important person in the room, the wine waiter, before proposing a toast. But at least I thought he got Cheryl's name right. I was expecting to come out and say Candy or some other girl or previous girlfriend's name or yeah. something like that. But he didn't do that. Now here's the thing. I'm, I'm, this is slightly different. I mean, and maybe it's because it's a different time, but maybe it's because it's in America. But yeah, you got a rehearsal. Is this full on... Uh, rehearsal like, dinner, that's a big thing, yeah. Right, okay. But you, you don't do the speeches as well, do you? And I wouldn't have thought of the rehearsal dinner. It'd just be, well, he's not really doing a speech. He's just doing a toast. No, but a toast, I know. I, have, I don't yeah, know. I think they would do toasts. You think so, yeah. yeah. Not big speeches, though. Bobby then makes a, a short speech talking about a future full of joy and happiness and then he kisses Cheryl and uh, the boys from the Impala group make weird whooping noises. Yeah, the, the 9021, oh, what a bunch of fannies. Um, yeah, they, they, they whoop and, and, and grunt as he gives her a kiss. They're just, they're just, they're scum, subhuman scum. <laughs> Gutter scrapings. Bobby then presents Cheryl with a wedding gift, which is an inappropriate colour television. Why is it inappropriate? Because they're about to join the Peace Corps. Yeah, but for how long? Well, I would imagine it's measured in years rather than Is it? Months. I don't know, yeah. Okay. I, mean, I, I assume. Sure. I mean, what's the point in going there for two months? Anyway. Yeah. Sam then decides to make a toast of his own, which causes the fannies to stand and proclaim that the mobile is going to make a speech. They can't help themselves, can they? Absolute waste. Which, who's, like, surely someone should be saying, get, get out, just get out. Yeah, someone should, yeah. Uh, really, it should be Bobby's father. Should we take them? He's probably laughing. Yeah. I mean, are they required at the rehearsal? Well, I think it's the day guests come, or I don't know, top team, I don't know. Um, anyhow, Sam does make this speech. He says he's incredibly proud to have Cheryl as his sister. says she has incredible strength and vision. He's proud of her for answering Kennedy's call to help the country instead of themselves and to aid those less fortunate. And he also toasts Bob. But he has a little dig saying that as there is no electricity in Tonga, he'll be watching Bonanza in colour. Thanks to his gift, yes. And I think, okay, so two things here. One, this was, I mentioned earlier, this was a, a, a nice, touching, genuine, heartfelt uh, speech here. And he was gracious enough to mention Bob, who he now despises. However, he was smartly putting pressure on... Cheryl? Uh, no, on Bob. on Bob, who's to again to mention publicly how he, they're going to Tonga yeah. making it harder for him to try and back out potentially. That's it. At this point Al shows up to make things a bit awkward because people are watching Sam talking to thin air including the Impala idiots. Yes. They start throwing food at him. Yeah I think they flick some dessert or hope it's dessert in his face and even though Al calls for a, a food fight a restrained Sam tells him that they need to go to the restroom Small boy now, someone said he doesn't need to go. Again, that was a nice touch. I'll tell you who that small boy was a wee bit later on. Okay. The idiots celebrate their idiocy, but meanwhile, in the restroom, Sam talks to Al about the bruises he saw on Cheryl's neck. And Al displays some of his privilege by saying that he never understood why women cover up for these monsters. Yeah, and Sam admits that he, he's tried talking her round, but if uh, you look like him, it might not be the... Yeah, because there's a mirror there, he spots yeah, himself. the most yeah. persuasive person to do so. We then have an incredibly weird scene. I, where would, I would almost say it's a segue out of the episode. Yeah, it doesn't really seem to be any need for this whatsoever. And uh, it's timing I don't think is accurate either. No, well, it's meant to be a young Michael Jackson. But it's a couple. He's only two years old in real life at this point. And he looks nothing like a young Michael Jackson looked. No. What happens? Well, he comes out of the toilet and asks who Sam's talking to. He says he's an actor and he's rehearsing and then he teaches him a wee dance, which well, he starts to do a wee dance, which the boy mimics. And he does some moonwalking. In the no, it's, it's, a, it's a Jackson Rocky, 5 song. It's Rocky it's Robin. in the background, but I don't know if it's actually playing. Uh, anyway. Um, so the wee boy's dancing around and then his older brother comes in, calls him Mikey, and he moonwalks off to the rehearsal. <laughs> Just, yeah, a strange scene. Utterly bizarre. I, know, I think some people probably just really enjoy that little I'm, I'm sure. break. Yeah. At this point, Bill and Bob stumble in and Sam hides in the cubicle where he overhears his suspicions come true. Hey, is that that new dance? <laughs> no, Dad. The twist goes like hey, this. Hey, you know, I can still <laughs> dance you off the floor. Hey, oh. Dad, take it easy. <laughs> You're oh. not as young as you oh. used to be. 
Oh, 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 you're right about that. That's why I took you in for a partner, right? <laughs> Boy, that dirty club. That's my boy. Watch. They can't hear me. Albert, they can't see me. So when are you going to tell them? After the honeymoon. What about tonight? I'm taking you into the business. I'm buying you a house for a wedding gift, and nobody knows it. That ain't fair, son. Dad, I understand, but Cheryl's gonna go nuts when I tell her we're not joining the Peace Corps. Son, she's 22 years old. She'll own her own house. She's got a husband who's a used car manager. What girl wouldn't go nuts? Dad, she's hot about this Peace Corps thing. What about you? Me? Teaching a bunch of headhunters how to fly fish? No way. <laughs> you know, your mother wanted to go to college. My getting her pregnant with you fix that. <laughs> Get the picture. <laughs> <laughs> you know, normally I'm against spreading men's room gossip, but in this case, it would be criminal not to. Absolute scumbaggery. Yeah. To corner into getting married. And yeah. then, uh, anyway. We got a wee bit of a time skip here, and Sam has had time to tell Cheryl all this. Yeah, she interrupts Bob and the Fannies and demands to know if it is true that he's accepted the job and that they're not going to be going to the Peace Corps. Fortunately, it's not true. Bobby's actually leading his dad along and is going to join the Peace Corps and tell his dad no after the wedding. I think um, as well, he, he tries to, he wonders how she knows this. <laughs> and, and again, it's nice, Sam doesn't pretend otherwise he says no that's me I, I told her i heard you interestingly bobby tries to then say oh look he's just sticking up for his sister don't get mad at him he thinks this is the case but it's not you know he's off base yeah and when sam calls him out on his lies he lunges for him well, it's not him it's one of the other guys lunges for him is it yeah and sam knocks him to the ground yeah and bobby says to yeah, back off the guy alone he's just trying to stick up for his sister yeah Cheryl again demands the truth and what does he say? He's, he reiterates what he said that he's leading his dad along, he's going to tell him no after the wedding. He's definitely going to join the Peace Corps. And at this point Sam asks if he's also going to turn down the house that has been uh, has been given as a gift and Bob sighs at this surprise being ruined apparently. Yes, they were going to, he was going to rent it out while they were away and have a nice house for them to come home to. Mm. She seems to be swaying and so Sam reiterates that he has no intention of joining the Peace Corps. And this frustrates Bob, but he tries to remain calm while Al tells Sam to race him for pinks. Yes, yeah, so first of all, Cheryl tries to settle the matter by telling Sam she believes Bobby and she's going through with the wedding. At this point, Sam, as you say, ordered on by Al, challenges Bobby to race for pinks the next day. And Bobby says 3 p.m. at the underpass, and Sam leaves while the boys all laugh. In the corner of the room, Sam asks Al why he is doing it, and Al explains it's psychological. Yeah, Billy's mask is going to drop when he gets taken down a peg or two, essentially. Yeah, if he can be beaten with a, a hunk of junk, it will, uh, his ego will be punctured. He then tells him to use nitrous oxide to give his engine a little boost, a bit like in the movie Turbo. So it's snails. Right. I don't think I've seen it. They use a little bit of a boost. Also, I remember, uh, again, I feel I might have discussed this back in the Columbo podcast. There was a great uh, made for TV movie by uh, directed by Hal Needham. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, a, it was a sort of B movie uh, called Death Car on the Freeway. That sounds familiar. I, I've probably discussed it. About yeah. a guy, it was black, you couldn't see who the driver was, but he'd a, he'd a van and he would play fiddle music and then he would. Uh, ram women, single women drivers off the road and, and kill them. Oh. And he had, a, he had a nitrous oxide button in that as well. So we can go oh, that fast. Yeah, I love that. I might try and search it. Search it again. Yeah, it's good. Lots, lots of women getting murdered. Can't beat it. Outside the house again, where we saw Jill and Sam working on the car before, they're installing a nitrous oxide tank. When he mentions the nitrous oxide, he warns them there's a risk of it blowing up. Yeah, that, that doesn't come up again, though. No, but my point is that this is a guy with six PhDs. He's one of the... Ah, but you don't know what he remembers and what he doesn't. Uh, okay, that's a that's a point, sure. Yeah, yeah but outside the house. Yes, as, as I said, Jill is talking to Sam. Um, they're installing this nitrous oxide, but there's a leak 
and they start laughing uncontrollably. <laughs> yeah. And we head under the, the bridge, the underpass. They pull up and hand over the, the pink ownership slips to one of the, the fannies. Sam makes Jill get out of the car and Bobby wants Cheryl to stay in his. Again, it's shown you, isn't it, here? So Sam is thinking about his passenger, about the potential uh, uh, ramifications where... And so he's been... Cautious, I guess. Yeah, cautious. Whereas the, 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 the Bob uh, doesn't care as much about Cheryl, but also is probably, from his, an ego point of view, he thinks he cannot be beaten, there's no risk. Yeah, probably. But then Sam appeals to his toxic masculinity. Says he's a chicken if he doesn't race him alone. Calls him McFly. And he says, nobody calls me a chicken. <laughs> Yells at Cheryl quite aggressively to get out of the car, which she does. Then he takes a drink from his hip flask and they move to the line. Their engines are revved and then the flag is dropped. Bob takes an early lead and Sam is about to hit the nitro until Al appears and tells him to wait. Sam's but really pleased to see Al. You would be. He's like, I'm glad you're here. Yes, you just like when he was uh, flying the, the plane. But also, um, it's perfect. You've got a co-pilot, but it, there's no weight there. Yes. <laughs> Al gives him the appropriate cue to hit the oxygen. We don't hear him stop it, but it obviously does. Mm -hmm. It doesn't explode. And he wins the race, and Jill claims the pinks. Yeah, he wins the race to the delight of not just Jill, but Cheryl yeah. uh, as well. And, as predicted, Bob can't handle this. And as Sam celebrates, he puts his foot down. Did you think he was going to drive in the back of the car and blow up with the nitrous oxide? I didn't know. It's probably not That's what, what I, I thought it was going really to Really? In quantum I thought, leap? I thought he was going to drive in the back and it was going to explode and kill him. Okay. But that, Pretty departure for the show, wouldn't it? It would have been a bit of a departure. <laughs> but, <laughs> or he pulls the side well, knocks out a small child and murders, done, murders they've done it this, They've done all this set up with the uh -huh. exploding nitrous oxide and it's not exploded. Sure. Maybe it wouldn't kill him, but it might damage his car yeah. or something. Yeah, okay, fair enough. But, um, no, he just drives to try and kill Sam. Yes, but uh, Cheryl or Jill shout on him, he jumps out the way and Bob smashes into a pillar. Fortunately for him, but not for us, he is uninjured. And he gets out and throws the keys of the wreck at Pizza Face and then dismisses the, the rightly enraged Cheryl. Well, she chucks her ring at him. He doesn't dismiss her. She tries to leave and he grabs her. And at this point, like the Dukes of Hazard, Sam slides across the, the, the car bonnet, or the hood, and punches him to the ground. How many takes did they need for that, do you think? A lot. I, yeah, I think that's not the first time. He range. stops halfway across <laughs> it because there's no... Buff up, shine it more! <laughs> buff up my jeans! <laughs> jeans yeah. um, and he warns him never to touch his sister again. Very heroic. Jill runs over, punches his sore arm. And Bobby tells the Impalas to get him, but they're not cool with attempted murder. No, this is, even for them, this is too much, and they, they walk away, leaving him alone in the dirt. As they get in the mom mobile, Sam grabs Jill and says something to her, and she returns Bobby's pink to him. He's not taking his car. No, but smashed up anyway. I think it's another, here, keep this piece of junk. Yeah, they all get in the mom mobile and they leave, and we skip ahead to the airport. Sam then has a chance to have a few last words with his sister as he sees her off on her uh, her solo trip to the Peace Corps. Yeah, why is he not leaped yet, we wonder? We do. She thanks him for saving her life, but he responds that she saved herself. And as they hug and she walks off, she tells him that she has left him a going away present at the, the shoeshine stand in the courtyard. That's a very creepy way to put it when you find out what's going on. It is. It's only just acceptable because it's from a, 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 a another woman. Well, well, we'll come back to this. They, they say they love each other, she's away, and outside at the shoeshine, Al shows up and sings Sam a little song. Yeah, he's wearing a, an electronic tie. As you do. Mm -hmm. We all do these days. It also shows him a, a picture of, of the girl and the car that he's recently picked up at the car auction. That's not Tina. No, it's not. <laughs> Sam asks how things turned out for Cheryl and then finds out what her present to him actually is. So tell me, Al, what happened to Cheryl? Oh, Cheryl, she's, she's still in the Peace Corps. She made it a lifetime commitment. Uh, she's in Africa with her husband at the moment and they're organizing a food cooperative in Chad. That's great. So? So. Why haven't you leaped? Yeah. I think maybe 
She's the reason. Cheryl insisted on the eyelashes. Feels like they're gonna fall off. They look great. You look great. You know, I always wished that you would be my first real guy friend. Your first guy friend? Well, yeah. Well, the first one I didn't want to sock or shoot was spitballs. Are you trying to tell me you never kissed anyone? Sam, go ahead, do it. What's wrong? I'm sorry. I just want to get this stuff all over you. <laughs> And of course, when they kiss, he leaps into a room where he's looking down on a body holding a gun. Yeah, it's a less romantic situation. He's uh, that looks like a great setup for an episode, though. It, uh, I'm, really, I'm it. really looking forward to it. And we've got the the now uh, standard oh boy, and well, it's not standard yet, but he's done it two in a row. So yeah, it's the end of the episode. So is, is Cheryl Jill's pimp now? Looks like it. She's taking a cut. Before we do the trivia, let's discuss what you found out or what you informed me about earlier today. Okay. I had no uh, had no knowledge of this, but apparently you've got... Okay, so the actor playing Jill, if you believe the date of birth that is on IMDb, on Wikipedia, on other websites, uh, was 12 years old. When no, I told. see. When you said that, no chance. She's not 12. It's come up in... MacGyver as well, I think one of the MacGyver podcasts talked about this because uh, she was 11 when she did an episode of MacGyver But was she playing an 11 year old? Or was she no, playing an older girl again yeah. See, I don't get this for a number of reasons One, uh, employing child actors is a pain in the, in the backside because there's just so many regulations you have to they can only, they can only work so, ah, so this was so the 80s No, 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 even back then it was just a big, big hassle. All sorts of insurances and things had to be put in place. That is why you get guys like Jason Priestley in their late twenties playing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So okay. So uh, I can't see them. There was no reason she wasn't such an incredible actress or a, a, even a name that went onto something else that you said, we must have her. Right? She's not a Jodie Foster or a, even a Drew Barrymore. Harsh. She's still working. I mean, I'm sure she's fine, but she wasn't like we must have her in this episode. You know, there's nothing to suggest that okay. she was perfectly fine. So I can't see why they would want to use a 12 year old to play a, what, a 16, 17 year old. And also, ac actors, especially women, are, you know, disappointingly, but historically, have often made themselves to be younger to get roles because, you know, it was a thing. If you could, e even I was, uh, re the, the, the guy from, uh, the bass player from Bon Jovi died recently and I was yeah. reading about him. When he was a young girl, he was. When he was a young girl, yeah. And, but he lied about his age as well. He said he was uh, 10 years younger because I think the rest of them were younger. And from a marketing point of view, that was part of the, the, the thing. So it's not uncommon for people in the entertainment industry to lie about their age. Well, the other possibility is she was 12 but made herself out to be older. She didn't look 12. I'm not sure that, that's not a defence in court. <laughs> but, uh, but even then, it's not, you can't just make yourself look older when you'd have to well, she might just be a naturally older looking girl. You still have to. I'm sure. Well, if you were going to fake your age, you can fake it in either direction. A twelve year old's not faking. Going how the how's a twelve year old going to get fake ID so they can work in movies a week? Oh, I I think now we can't find. There's no. She's on Twitter. The the, the, the actor, but yeah, I, we're I, not going to give her abuse and say you're not as young no, as you say you're. We're not. I mean, we could ask her, but I'm, I'm sure if she's uh, if she's been lying about it for, for for all these years, she's not going to go. Yeah, Ian, you've you've got me this time. Yep, yeah, it's not me that's saying she's not that age. It's you. Yeah, but you'd be asking her. You don't want to do the old twitters and what have you. So uh, yeah, I, I'm, I find this hard to believe. You're not willing to believe it because of what it would mean. No, I'm not willing to believe it because I looked at her and meant she, there's no chance she's twelve. Oh. Nothing makes Many sense. Many men have made a similar mistake. Nothing. No, I don't think it's a mistake. <laughs> uh, Nothing about it suggests that she would be 12 there. She doesn't look at it and there'd be no reason well, for them to employ her. Her birth suggests that she'd be 12. No, it's just what she says. How do you know it's just what she says? She could have produced a, d a birth certificate. Well, if she could have produced... Uh, so it could be a fake then, as you're saying. Maybe she wasn't actually born in Hawaii either. Yeah, I'm not buying it at all. 
I'm saying she's at least uh, what, 12, I'm saying she's at least 4 Yes, that's the thing, we're not, we're not talking about being a crazy amount of age difference here Like, if she was uh, 16 or 17 really, she's only knocking a few years off it but when, So she's not done that then, she's done it later you think? Like around well, when, she, when she, IMDb came out, there was a scandal at one point with IMDb outing people for their real age I don't, think it's a, I don't think that's a scandal. Well, I, think I remember, I remember it being fine. an issue women in the industry I'm, were concerned I'm, about, and some men probably. Maybe, but I'm sorry, if you're lying about it, you can put up for your lies. It's not a... So, <laughs> if IMDb were doing that to other people, why have they not done it to her? If her, I, if her dates have she's not big enough. No one no one mm. really... She's not uh, She's not a star. But I think there's things about like Joan Collins and that other one, that, that, that sort of profile, um, who have been some of the biggest uh, actors around, especially back then. Have been if she was 12, would that make you more concerned about what you saw on screen? Uh, yeah. If Scott Bakula thought she was 12, how uncomfortable that, that, would that, he that's have been? Why, that's why I don't believe this. I, I think that any of the, the producers, the actors would be saying, no, just I'm not kissing her, she's 12. Go and get someone else, we don't need to there, do this. You're, you're 18 in this episode, you're 17 in this yeah, episode. Nah, but we, I, I think everyone would be thinking there's no, there's no need for this. Yeah. Anyway. And saying that, as I mentioned, I mean, Jodie Foster famously played a, a child prostitute when she was 12 in Taxi Driver. And, um, what's her name, Brooke Shields was, no, she was really young, she was getting oh, well, exploited. She play, yeah, she was in uh, Blue Lagoon, but before that in a movie called Pretty Baby, where she played a prostitute, and she got naked in it, and she was only about 12 at the time. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Going back to the story, do you think Bobby will even really be bothered at the end of this? Uh, there's bound to be somebody else who likes the idea of a house of her own and a husband with his own business, however she gets treated. Oh, I mean, I think there's plenty of women you know, out there who think. would be, who would, you know, he's a fairly attractive guy. I and don't think his life will be affected at all. No, he'll get some other sucker. Yeah. And yeah, it, it'll, it'll, it'll be charming at first until... So Sam's maybe condemned someone who otherwise wouldn't have had an abusive marriage. That's a, that's a good point, yeah. Oh yeah, he's not learnt the error of his ways and becomes a... That in fact probably makes him more of an alcoholic now and more of an abusive type. Yeah, he wants to be more in control. Yeah. So this doesn't happen to him again. Yeah. Hmm. Any other thoughts? Um, no, not, 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 nothing that we've not discussed already, I don't think. Okay, shall we get into some trivia? Go for it. Original air date was the 10th of May 1989, directed by Alan J. Levy, or Levi, or Levy. This was the first of six episodes that he directed, uh, he's well known. He's worked on shows like Battlestar Galactica, Airwolf, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, ER did three Columbos, Uneasy Lies the Crown, Columbo and the Murder of a Rockstar. And he did No Time to Die. Yeah, two out of three is not bad. Yeah. yeah. Albeit, yeah, they're not the greatest episodes. <laughs> but he's also married to a friend of the show, the Colombo alum, Sondra Curry. Oh, yes. Yes, we've uh, spoke to Sondra a few times. Yeah, you really upset her one time. I, I didn't really upset her at all. It was a mistake anyway. Anyway, uh, Alan is still working as a director. Paul Brown, or Paul L. Brown, as he's sometimes known, wrote the episode. First of 13. So obviously you're in with the, the team at this point. He's also written for X-Files, Star Trek Voyager, Star Trek Enterprise and Disney's Camp Rock. And he was a producer or co-producer for 64 Quantum Leap episodes and directed one episode and appeared in another episode. So he's obviously part of the team. And, and the, the, the fabric of it. Yeah. Romy Walthall, who's credited as Romy Windsor in this episode and for some reason is one of two people in this situation where they changed their name, it's quite interesting. She played Cheryl, this was her only Quantum Leap appearance, but she also appeared on shows like TJ Hooker, Murder One, The X-Files, as well as movies like The House of Usher and Face Off, but she sadly died unexpectedly last year in 2021 when she was just 57. Her son is the actor Morgan Krantz, who himself is best known for roles in In the Dark and Better Call Saul. Sure. You say change her name, it's interesting, maybe it was her married name? It could be, um, but the interesting thing is the fact that Kevin Spurtis, who played Bob, was credited as Kevin Blair in this episode, so he too has changed his name. It might be that earlier in the career you're using your, your real I own think name. That's, and then you get your equity or something yeah. like that, yeah. But it's just interesting that the two leads in this were both the uh, sure. um, same situation. He played Bob or Bobby Thompson. This again was his only Quantum Leap role, but he also appeared in shows like Rituals, Valley of the Dolls and Days of Our Lives, amongst others, and he received multiple Emmy nominations for his work on After Forever. He's going to be 60 in July, and um, probably around about the time this comes out, and he remains active. Happy birthday. We'll see if we can find him on... Oh, well, we should have a big party for Kevin. Yeah. He's on Twitter. Is he? Yeah. Let's mention it. Anyone listening at the time, if you want to wish him a happy birthday, and mention us at the same time that Tell would be. Tell him we sent you, yeah. yeah. Robert Costanzo, 
Chuck Thompson, the father of the, the bride, father of the groom. This was his only Quantum Leap appearance. He's been in everything else, though. Uh, from the best Die Hard movie, Die Hard 2, to Total Recall, to Star Trek The Next Generation. Best Die Hard movies, Die Hard 3. Well, it's in there. Two or three. The first three are the only ones worth watching. No, two, two is weak. I'd yeah, say, I like two. No, I'd go three, one, then two, then the other. Anyway. Is it your four and five? <laughs> no, we're not interested in them. He's, he had Golden Girls, Murder, She Wrote. He was even in Colombo. He played a police officer in Colombo Goes to the Guillotine. Yeah. He's still working. He's approaching 300 screen credits. He's 79 years old. A typical hard-working character actor. Holly Fields, as we know, played Jill. This is her only Quantum Leap appearance. Best known for her voice work. She's known for impersonating or mimicking many very well-known actors, including Cameron Diaz. Um, she does a lot of Shrek work. And also appeared on shows like MacGyver, Blossom, Charmed. Now, uh, allegedly 45 years old. Uh, although 55 for something in your book, I think. Uh, she's still an active performer, does a lot of ADR work, as we say. And she tours her music in Japan, where she's a successful recording artist. Jason Priestley, quite a, a low key role for a guy who's got a big name. Yes, yeah, so this must have just been before 90210. Well, just, I think he was already in 90210, but maybe hadn't hit the big time quite yet. Yeah, maybe they were filmed at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, obviously, he's best known for Beverly Hills 90210. This is his only. Quantum Leap appearance, but he's also appeared on shows like MacGyver, Spin City, True Calling, and uh, one of your favourites. It's not one of my favourites, but I've been watching it uh, the other, uh, last year, The uh, Private Eyes. Yeah. Good, yeah. He has also, interestingly, often played versions of himself on shows, in more than just these three, but there's the revived BH90210, he's been on The Twilight Zone playing a version of himself and How I Met Your Mother, okay. and others as well. He's now 52 and he's still an active actor. I was looking at his trivia earlier today and it uh, mentioned the fact that uh, he coincidentally he was a uh, he had done for drunk driving and smashing his car into a pillar he was just trying to recreate, recreate this episode yeah uh, richard mcgonigal played the father of the bride bill wilson you only saw him briefly a few times laughing at jokes and then in his pants and vest at the start this was his only quantum leap episode but he's also appeared on the twilight zone 21 jump street star trek the next generation star trek voyager and seinfeld as well as being a prolific voice actor including work on dragon age origins still the best rpg there is he's now 75 years old and still working his wife janie was played by janet carroll this was her only quantum leap but she also appeared in shows like 21 jump street melrose place beverly hills 90210 and scrubs amongst others and she was joel's mother in risky business if you know that film i do she died in 2012 when she was 71. Mary Pat Gleason, you might have recognised her face. She played Mrs. Thompson, the father of the mother of the groom. Uh, she's a really prolific actor. This was her only quantum leap, but she's appeared on things like Murder She Wrote, Friends, Sex in the City, and ER. She's been in films like Basic Instinct, The Crucible, and Intolerable Cruelty. I remember that scene vividly when she crossed and uncrossed her legs. She died in 2020 unfortunately from cancer at the age of 70. Scott Menville, he's interesting. He plays the reflection of Cam Wilson. This was his only Quantum Leap appearance but he's been most successful as a voice actor both before and since this. He's over 300 screen credits, sorry almost 300 screen credits to his name including voicing Fred Flintstone on the Flintstone Kids from 86 to 88. Bingo Beaver in the Get Along Gang, one of my childhood favourites. Wait a second, in 86 he was voicing Fred Flintstone? Yeah. So four, uh, As a teenager. four or five years before this, he was playing like a a, a, a gruff builder in his 40s. He's obviously, he's got a good voice for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, Matty in Captain Planet, another show that I watched a lot when I was a kid. Uh, and probably most recognisably and famously, uh, he's the voice of Robin on the various Teen Titans and Teen Titans Go series and films. He's now 51. He's still active. Edmund L. Schaff played the minister. He was very briefly on screen. This was his only episode of Quantum Leap. He's also been on things like Murder, She Wrote, Babylon 5, Days of Our Lives, Beverly Hills Nina 210, and most recently, Modern Family. Tom Verica, or Verica, played one of the unnamed Impalas. I think the one with Impala on the back of his jacket would be my best guess. This was his only Quantum Leap episode, but he too was in Die Hard 2, as well as series like Ellie Law, Will and Grace, and How to Get Away with Murder. Um, he's now a producer on Bridgerton, despite not appearing in that series, and he's 58 years old, still working. Brandon Quinton Adams played the older brother of Michael Jackson. He's perhaps best known. Are you going to get through every single person in no, this? No, there's only a couple more. I've, I took loads of them out. 
This is interesting, this is a good one. He's best known because he, not the one playing Michael Jackson, he appeared in Moonwalker. That's that's trivia. See the, see the, the minister, right? You could have cut him. That was. Oh, I, see I, might, I might cut that out as I said it here because there was no trivia. That, this is more trivia. Go for it. He was also in The Mighty Ducks and I think Smooth Criminal. Yeah. And after taking a 15 year break, he returned to acting in 2018. So he's now 42 and an active performer. And finally, the little boy who didn't want to go to the toilet was played by Michael Belisario. The son of Donald Belisario. Uh, this was the first of four uh, short appearances that he makes in the series. Um, he's another who took a break from acting, having appeared in shows like JAG and NCIS before returning in 2018. And he has a role in the upcoming Elvis Presley biopic Elvis opposite Tom Hanks. JAG, JAG. Yeah, JAG. Yeah, JAG. JAG. Okay. It's in capitals. Mm -hmm. You can call it JAG if you want. Yeah. He's now 42 years old as well, still acting. Uh, in terms of trivia, I've already told you what Racing for Pinks is, or we found out watching the show. We know about Holyfield's age. Michael Jackson himself covered Rocky Robin, interestingly enough. Uh, JFK established the Peace Corps earlier in 1961. Um, Leave it to Beaver, we've talked about. So, in terms of things that we learned... Al has Russian heritage on his mother's side. Or so he says. Uh, Sam's sister had an abusive marriage, and at some point Sam has learned how to fix a car engine. Yeah, again, he's a He's a, he's a top engineer, so yeah. pretty simple stuff for that, that type of person, I thought. Anything else you picked up? Nope. Next week, we're going to have Play It Again at Seymour. The title's maybe a bit indicative. It's Sam tracking down a killer. So we will see you in 1953. I'm really looking forward to that. Until then, cheerio. Bye-bye.